Okay, let's go over Burns real quick. So here are some stats. So 80% of all burns occur at home. So that's important. So make sure when you're cooking, turn those handles in, especially for small children that could walk by the stove, reach up and grab that handle. You don't want something like that to happen. On average, 2 million uh, burns each year. 75,000 of those are hospitalized. 3,000 deaths occur. And most deaths occur because of bacterial infection. So that's an important thing thing to remember is that's what we're most concerned about is bacterial infection from the burn. Yes, you can cause damage to certain areas of the body and you can lose function, but bacterial infection has the greatest risk or that's the greatest risk from burns is um, severe life-threatening emergencies resulting from bacterial infection. So children under the age of five and elderly over 55 are at the highest risks uh, of dying from burns. And most of that's because a young child, their immune system is still developing. And for an older person, their immune system is declining. So that's the reason they tend to be at greatest risk. Plus, a child is small, and they tend to, when they get burned, a, largest, a larger amount of body surface area is often burned uh, when, when they experience burns. So we have different types. We have thermal, which would be like your heat-related burns, chemical burns, electrical burns, and radiation burns. And we'll talk about each one of those. So your thermal burns are direct contact with a flame, indirect contact where it flashes past you but you're close enough to receive the heat from it. Water can be considered burn because of the heat within it. It's a heat sink, it holds a lot of heat in it. So like boiling water coming in contact with that and steam. A lot of people don't realize how easily steam can burn you. So if you're cooking and you take a hot lid off and you've got your face up over it to smell the food, you, do, you could receive a severe burn from that, so you got to be real careful around steam. A lot of people accidentally get burned, especially while cooking. Contact time can determine how bad the burn is, obviously. So full thickness burn um, is a third degree burn, and that's where you're burned all the way down through all the layers of the tissue, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Exposure to water greater than 113 degrees, skin death can start to occur at that moment, but it would take some time at 113 degrees, obviously, but skin death can start to occur. But the temperatures of most concern, 140 degrees for three seconds. So think of running out a hot bath and not filling of the water and stepping into it. And often kids get burned this way where an adult will put them in there and they don't realize how hot the water is. And so it doesn't take long. Most of our water heaters, if you just turned on the hot water, are set at 140 degrees or if not higher sometimes. 156 degrees, one second of exposure can cause skin death to occur. So it's something to keep in mind, especially if you have young kids in the house. Chemical burns, you have acids. So hydrochloric acid is a pool cleaner. Muratic acid, that's hydrochloric acid. So really super low pH can burn you really fast. Alkaline objects, so sodium hydroxide is a pickling agent. It's food safe. There's food grade sodium hydroxide. Actually, calcium hydroxide is more often used for pickling. Sodium hydroxide is often used even in food preservation to some extent, but more often than not, it's calcium hydroxide. Um, potassium hydroxide is found in wood ash. In fact, that's what lye soap is made from. They take the potassium hydroxide, they soak the wood ash in water and then strain off the water and then reduce the water and that's how they get more concentrated potassium hydroxide to mix with fats and stuff to make lye soap in survival situations. Well, I shouldn't say survival situations and more of like wilderness type of survival more of like a living off the land type of the stuff. 
Organic compounds, carbon-based organic compounds can burn you. So uh, never make the mistake, if you own a motorcycle, of filling up the gas tank while you're still still sitting on the motorcycle. I did that once, and you know my skin is kind of rough because it's been exposed to the sun, but when organic compounds like gasoline hit sensitive areas, they burn. So yes, they can burn you, and they also have some nasty chemicals in them benzene being a carcinogen so care for chemical burns okay so we've got some chemicals that are activated by water so you really need to know what chemical you're dealing with so remove the chemical off by brushing it off not with your hand but with a brush or something where it's not going to get on more exposed skin because in that area will start to get burned uh, remove any contaminated clothing so if you've taken a chemistry class, you've probably seen the rundown they have in there. And then um, avoid activated chemicals with water. So there are certain chemicals like magnesium that's, or, or sodium. Sodium will ignite just in the air. So there are certain chemicals that are activated by water. And obviously I wouldn't want to, if I got acid on me, wouldn't want to put a base on it. And then that, because that could create heat. So... Um, you got to know what you're working with. So flush the area for about 20 minutes or longer as long as it's not activated by water and cover the area to reduce bacterial infection. That's a common theme you're going to hear repeated throughout the Burns lecture is bacterial infection being the greatest risk. So if the chemical is activated by water, brush the dry chemicals away. Um, so try not to use anything that can activate it. And if the burn is second degree or greater, so greater than 10% body surface area, and I'll show you while well, I'll talk about how to determine that in just a second. So if it's greater than 10% body surface area, it becomes a, an emergency, and one that you could take somebody to the hospital for. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to take them or call 911, but this is something where they'll probably want post well, advanced medical care, I should say, not necessarily post-medical care. So they're not going to have to stay overnight, but they may need to seek out a doctor's advice on how to treat or a nurse. Electrical burns. So this is of a concern almost everywhere because we have electricity everywhere. So the arc itself from the electrical current can burn you just from flashing past you. True electrical contact where it actually travels through your body is more dangerous because it can burn you externally as well as internally. So it does damage to the nerves and blood vessels. So our nerves already send electrical signals out to the muscle. They can be overloaded and damaged by electrical current traveling through them. And same thing with the vessels. And then they can just contract or they can just expand and relax because they're damaged. So our blood vessels would just relax and go into widespread vasodilation, which could lead to shock depending on how much is damaged. Nerves won't regenerate, so if we do great enough damage, we could lose feeling in one area if we survive or have permanent damage, neurological damage as a result. That's what happens sometimes when individuals are struck by lightning. You know, often if it travels through your body, you're gonna have an entrance wound that can be quite small, it's not always small, but then you'll have an exit wound that can be quite large. So there have been cases where current has gone through somebody and blown a limb off or blown their foot off or a hand or what have you. Because the exit wound where that electrical current is just trying to get to the ground and then you are the ground or the ground wire to get them to the ground. Or get the electrical current to the ground. Electrical burns and arrhythmias. This is one major concern anytime somebody gets electrocuted is it could put them into a ventricle fibrillation. So that's where the heart quivers. It has electrical signal. It could put you into a systole where the heart is completely dead. But ventricle fibrillation, that arrhythmia is not uncommon if somebody has been electrocuted. So then in that case, if they go into ventricle fibrillation, we'd have to perform CPR or get an AED to try to shock them back to a normal rhythm. So care for electrical burns, check the scene. You don't want to become a victim yourself. So checking the scene is extremely important 
if you think somebody's been electrocuted because you don't want to run up and touch them and they're still being electrocuted and now you're electrocuted. Turn off the electricity to the location if, if you suspect there's electrical contact within an area. So if there are no signs of life, call 911, begin CPR. If the victim's still breathing, then check for in injuries and monitor their condition. Cover any external burns, because again, remember, bacterial infection is one of our greatest concerns. You've got a couple things going on with electrical burns. We've got to worry about permanent damage to vessels and nerves. We've got to worry about them going into or having an arrhythmia as a result of being shocked. There's a bunch of stuff, but bacterial infection as well. Body surface area. We've already talked about it a little bit, but what is it and what does it mean and how is it used in treating burns? So it helps us determine the severity of the burn by measuring the size. So the easiest method is to determine the rule of nines. So if I'm an adult, which I am, I hope, one limb, one arm is 9%. One leg is 18%. The front side of my torso is 8%. The back side of my torso is 8%. My head is 9%. If it's scattered burns, so this, that's if you have certain areas. Like if my whole arm is burned, I know 9% of my body is burned. But I have pretty long arms, so it might be more for me. But it's just to give you a rough, quick estimate how much of the body is burned. Because that's going to determine if we really need to go to the hospital or even call 911 it determines the severity and also we'll get into the type of burn not just how much area is burned all of these will factor in your decision making so for an adult like i just said arms are nine percent heads nine percent front torso 18 back torso legs are eight eight eighteen percent uh, for infants and children, they haven't fully developed, so an infant's head is much bigger than their body, so it's considered 18%. Infant's leg is only 13.5 compared to that of an adult. Child's head's 12%, and their leg is 16.5, so they're starting to grow into their head there. And um, so that's body surface area. I know that sounds so bad. Um, roll of hands. So if they're scattered burns, like in the case of Oil, like cooking oil, that happens a lot to children. Um, or water, steam, we can have scattered burns. And so you're, the victim's hand, not yours, but the victim's in hand is considered 1% body surface area. So you can kind of visualize your hand and match it up to the burned areas, not touching it, but match it up and get a rough estimate if there are, have scattered burns. Um, Classifying burns, this becomes important when determining if they're going to have to go to the hospital or not. First degree, superficial, we're just talking about the epidermis, the upper layers are burned. So this would be something like a sunburn. As long as it's less than 50% of the body, we may not have to go to the hospital. Second degree burns, and obviously if, if, if somebody's in a lot of discomfort and they need some pain relief, take them to see a doctor, right? But we're talking about emergencies where you're going to have to go to the hospital or call EMTs. 50% or less on a first degree, we're not really worried about it there. Now, obviously, we still want to treat them and, and, and make them as comfortable as possible. Second degree, this is considered partial thickness. So now not only is the epidermis burned, but the dermis is burned. And so what happens is the vessels and the nerves are damaged and that's where a lot of the pain comes from because it's not just like the epidermis where they just the tips of the nerves are burned but now we're getting down into the nerve itself and so you can have scarring with second degree burns but the key here on determining what type of burn if there's any blistering it's a second degree so it got down into the dermal layer and has damaged a vessel and that plasma that's coming out in the burn itself is the fluid coming from that damaged vessel. 
So third degree, full thickness, all the way to the bone. So you burned the epidermis, you burned the dermis, and you've gotten it all the way down through the subcutaneous fat and tissue, like muscle, could all be all the way to the bone. So severe damage in those cases. So we talked about first degree, superficial, epidermis. You, you'll have redness, dilation. That's where the discoloring comes from. If you're light skinned, you can see that. Um, probably no scarring, but you may peel. The example I used of that is we were in Hawaii one time. There was a lady out sun tanning, and she was there when we left in the morning. She was there when we came back, and she was beet red. So we woke her up, and she was severely burned. I think she ended up going to a hospital. It may have been greater than first degree, even from that solar radiation, because when we saw her before we left, she had small blisters. So it went... Most sunburns are first degree, but she'd gone so severe, she started to blister and got down into the dermal layers. And it was so widespread across her body, she went to the hospital. I'm, I'm pretty sure she did. She had to have. Um, I was pretty young, so I didn't get to talk to her very long. So um, running the burned area under cool tap water. So this care and these first steps I'm about to talk about is the same for first degree and second degree. And so if somebody gets burned, our first step is to cool that area because we don't want secondary death to occur. And we talked a little bit about that but I'm going to talk some more in just a second. And then you give them ibuprofen to relieve pain, but also to reduce inflammation. Now here's where it changes. With first degree, you're applying aloe to rehydrate and speed up healing, and you may want to elevate it. But on second degree, all those same steps apply, but we're going to give them a triple antibiotic ointment. But first, let's go back here and talk a little bit about secondary death. So, like I mentioned in the previous slide, if an area gets hot, gets inflamed, the cells will use more oxygen, more of them will die off because of the hypoxic condition. But if you cool that area faster, less cells will die, and so therefore you're, re you're speeding up recovery. Second degree burns. These are partial thickness. So they go through the epidermis, through the dermal layers. Swelling and blistering occur because of the damage to the underlying vessels. There's a lot of pain because the nerves are damaged because you've gotten all the way down in through that dermal layer. High risk of infection. So you don't want to be popping these blisters. That blister is a covering. It is your skin still, but it now has fluid between the epidermis and the dermal layer because of the damaged vessels but it's a protective layer, so that's why you don't want to pop them. Now, they may drain them when you get to the hospital, but we want to keep that protective layer on there until we seek medical care if we have to go to that extreme. So less than 10% body surface area. Again, run it under cool water, just like we did with first degree. Get put a, instead of aloe, we're going to put triple antibiotic ointment. We still give them ibuprofen. Your very first step in all these in these first two cases is to run it under cool water to reduce that secondary death, alleviate pain. That does not change. But what does change is antibiotic ointment. Now, giving them water to drink or giving them ibuprofen, that doesn't matter what order it's in as long as your first step on first degree and second degree is cooling it under water first. So I don't care what order you do the other steps in. And then don't rupture the blisters and then cover the wound with a loose wrapping. So non-stick dressing because we don't want it sticking to the blisters because it's going to have to be peeled off when you get to the doctor or when you clean it. So non-stick sterile dressing. If you've ever looked at the military burn packets, so when you rip them open, it's almost like a it's a, it's a flexible coating, but it's non-stick like Teflon, right? And so it's already soaked in a triple antibiotic ointment. So when you rip the package open, it's already saturated with that antibiotic ointment. And then you can apply it directly to the burn. And that's mainly, the reason we're covering it is to prevent contamination. That's the reason we're using that antibiotic ointment is to reduce bacterial infection, right? We've mentioned that several times. Second degree burn is greater than 10% body surface area. So this is 
same situation that we just mentioned above, doing the same steps, except now since it's greater than 10% body surface area, we're calling 911. Why are we calling 911? Because it's greater than 10% body surface area. That means a lot of fluid could be lost in those burns as that percentage increases. And you can get scarring. So you also want to seek out medical attention for anything that's greater than 10% body surface area. Remember that one, that the rule of nines, like my arm for an adult is 9% body surface area. I'm going to see a doctor if my whole arm is burned, right? So, and that's even under the 10% body surface area, but that's really where you start getting concerned. Third degree, full thickness, all the way through the epidermis, dermis, subcutaneous layers, through the fats, through the muscle. Uh, the skin may appear dry and waxy or leathery. That's because there's no very little oxygen getting to it because the vessels have been damaged. Nerve loss, so you may not feel any pain in that area. Lack of circulation, again, leading to no pain in that area. But that tissue is dead. It's got to be removed. It's going to get necrotic. They have to go to the doctor in the case of a third degree. Uh, mainly to get that wound cleaned up, get it treated, get some skin grafts, all that stuff's going to apply when they seek medical care. So if somebody has a third degree, you need to call 911 and uh, you may even have to treat them for shock because the wounds around third degree are going to be second degree, so they're going to weep, weep fluid. So there's going to be some fluid loss and it, it, again, we're worried about bacterial infection. So seeking medical care, there are some other situations. So if you have burns to your face, hands, feet, genitals, you want to go get medical care, obviously, for those. And here's why. Um, not just because it's going to be painful, because you could lose function of your hands and feet. You could have severe scarring on your face. You don't want to lose function in these areas, right? So go seek medical care. So I had a buddy when he was young, they had a wood burning stove that tells you how long ago it was in their house and those get super hot they're super dangerous to have kids around he put his hand up against it just for a brief second and it peeled off that layer it gave him third degree in the palm of his hands he had to have skin grafts even then he could even now in his 40s cannot fully open that hand because it was to a sensitive area so sensitive areas fingers toes arms legs neck chest, anything where you could have a circumference burn, you need to seek medical care because it can cut off circulation. So that means if I had a burn that went around my whole arm, it could cut off circulation depending on the severity of that burn. I need to seek medical care. Respiratory emergencies. So this is what a lot of people don't think about. Uh, and military, our, our military have been exposed to this, especially in the war in Iraq and Afghanistan where they had to go in these buildings. You can have flashover events, and it can be from a fire, it can be from a bomb going off, and the actual blast may not kill you, but it's the superheated air that you breathe in, and you may not even know that it's damaged your lungs, but it's damaged it enough for fluid to weep into your lungs, which is pneumonia, right? So you could die from the fluid buildup in your lungs because you aspirated that hot vapor. So if you suspect anybody has had a flashover event where flames have shot into one room and it's superheated the air, they need to go seek medical care if there was a chance that they breathed in that superheated air. So no medical problems, obviously. Let's, let's go back to that original statement before we end. Bacterial infection is of most concern with burns. So th that makes diabetes extremely dangerous because your immune system is already suppressed, right? Your, your cells aren't getting enough glucose because your body's not producing enough insulin or you're insulin resistant. So you already have a pre-existing problem. Heart disease, your immune system is going to be compressed. Any type of disease or injury can suppress your immune system because your body's having to deal with other things. And if that occurs in conjunction with a burn, your chances of bacterial infection are much higher because you don't have the immune system to deal with it. Your immune system is compromised. So if somebody suffers burns, and let's say they normally you would not call, but it's second degree or above, and they have a compromised immune system or could have, 
I would go ahead and call. Think of diabetes, how somebody can get a wound and it doesn't heal. Like a small cut could lead to an amputation in some diabetic victims. Same thing. If they suffer a burn, they may have a real hard time having it heal because they have lack of circulation to those limbs or those areas or the cells just aren't functioning right. Same thing applies. Okay, here's your burn skill video. Pretty simple. The first step I want to see is that you cool it off underneath water. So here we're dealing with minor second degree burn. I'm just going to open the lecture notes for just a second. It gives you all the steps that we talked about. Actually, second degree burn greater than 10% body surface area. We're going to cool the area first. We're going to go in, apply triple antibiotic ointment. Um, actually, this one's less than 10% body surface area because we're not calling 911. Non-stick sterile dressing and then loosely wrapped. I just want to see that's how you would treat it at home, right? And if you had any pre-existing problems, then you could call 911. If it was greater than 10% body surface area, then you would... Um, greater than 10%, you would call 911. Sorry, I can only do one thing at a time. You can tell I'm thinking about what I want to write here. So minor second degree burn, I'm going to put less than 10%. BSA, body surface area. All right, so that's what we're talking about here. Put that in parentheses here so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So that would be considered minor. And the reason I knew that it was minor before reading minor second degree burns is because we're not calling 911 or we're not taking them to the doctor. Don't necessarily have to call 911 if it's greater than 10%, but they do need advanced medical care. So if this was a situation where it was greater than 10% body surface area, I don't necessarily have to call 911, but they do need advanced medical care. Now, if it was third degree, I'd probably call 911 and get them activated as soon as possible. All right. The, so lecture notes. Again, I have an area for you to submit the lecture notes that's kind of new because y'all were handing these in in the face-to-face -face because of the coronavirus doing everything online for a little bit. So I want you to take these, save them as a Word document, just like you would your template. Right underneath the lecture notes, where you found these on Canvas, is a place to submit them and submit them the same way.